Slava Isusu Christu, glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome to the online Capital Ukrainian Festival. This year we're online. Last year and next year we'll be in person. Today we'll talk about iconography, icons. Icons came to Ukraine by the 10th century. And so we'll learn a little bit about what they are, why we use them, why they look the way they do, and more specifically, how they're made. So it's a very short introduction today. If you're an expert, you'll notice I've skipped a thousand steps. But if you're interested, next year come to the Capital Ukrainian Festival and we'll be able to talk more. So let's proceed. We begin iconography, as you know, is a religious art. It's an art that depicts the holy persons, Jesus Christ, his mother, uh, Mary, or the mother of God, called the Theotokos in Greek, and all the holy personages in the Bible. So it's a religious art, and in Christianity there is a rationale for depicting uh, Jesus Christ and God, uh, because he was born and people could see him. You'll notice that other religions some other religions in the world do not depict God, and this is considered to be disrespectful. In Christianity, uh, we know that God became man, we're made in his image, we look like him when he was here on earth, and so we have a rationale for depicting uh, icons and depicting God in icons. So we remember that the word icon in Greek means image. And because we are created in God's image, we are icons. So now that we know why we create icons and the fact that we are an icon as an image of God, uh, we're going to talk about iconography that was created in Byzantium. Byzantium uh, was an empire, the capital of which was Constantinople, today's Istanbul. And so Christianity came from that area of the world to Ukraine. And that's why we have a Byzantine style of iconography in our icons. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the concept of an icon. It's not a realistic concept. The eyes are big, the nose is small and very linear. Uh, there's usually a gold halo around the head to illustrate the fact that there is literally goodness and light emanating out of a holy person and out of God. And so uh, what we'll talk about is the fact that uh, when we create this process, it's, it's not just like Western painting, where an artist takes his best techniques and his nicest ideas and portrays uh, some religious scene. It's beautiful to look at. In Eastern iconography or Byzantine iconography, there's a different concept at work. What we talk about is something that is like the Gospels. We portray theology and we portray the story uh, of God among us. So in iconography, an iconographer doesn't express his own personal ideas about something, but expresses in his own style and by his own hands something that is inspired by the church. And so iconographers actually use manuals of different compositions and different uh, ways of portraying things. Uh, icons are always begun with a prayer. There is a prayer before beginning an icon where we ask for divine guidance, we pray and we fast while writing icons, and we also have rules that say don't be jealous of someone else's work, be happy with what you did, be open, open your heart, allow uh, the Lord to guide you and your hands in what you do. The work is not yours, it belongs to Him. Here we've got different, uh, different stages. You begin with a drawing. You can create your own drawing according to uh, a preformed composition. Uh, then, of course, you will transfer it onto paper, and then you would transfer it onto your board. We go from dark pigments 
to light pigments in the icon. And you can see that from going from dark to light, you then come up with the final result. In icons, we use natural elements. We use wood, we use egg, we use chalk and rabbit skin glue from, from dead, already dead rabbits. Uh, we use natural pigments as much as possible from minerals and from plants. And we also use uh, the human touch. So icons are the ultimate green art form. People ask me all the time, why do we say that we write icons instead of painting them? It's because icons are the gospel in color. Just as you don't change the words of the gospel to fit your own personal meaning, uh, you don't change the colors or the symbolism or the basic format of an icon so that everyone can read it in the same understanding of what this holy person, this saint, or Jesus Christ was. And so here we have certain features of icons. For example, there's a gold halo or avraola. And the gold halo is literally light emanating out of that person. We have the sign that says what this is. Here we have mater theu, meaning the mother of God, and Isus Christos, Jesus Christ. We have also Christ blessing with his, in his name. We have uh, here, the mother of God wearing a deep red vestment, but it is over her blue inner cloak. Blue in the Byzantine world had different symbolisms, but one of them was that it symbolized humanity. Here we have the red, the deep red was the red of the emperor or of divinity. And so here, when we look at this icon and see this, these colors, we understand that the mother of God was born a human, cloaked in divinity. And very often you will see, we also see that Jesus Christ, in the way he's portrayed in this unfinished icon, he is divine, cloaked in humanity. So the colors... Uh, the gold, meaning eternity and the emanation of light, they're all very symbolic and they need to be part of every icon. In icons, we also remember that icons are different from regular pictorial art in that the light source comes from within. If you look closely, and you, you won't be able to hear, but if you look closely in portraits, we see that there's usually a little speck of light in the iris, showing that the light comes from outside. In icons, there is no such speck. The light source comes from within, and we see it here in the facial features and so on, where the light emanates from within. So we have a different or a different sense of what an icon is as opposed to Western art. And so we say that we write icons as the gospel in color. Everything about the icon is symbolic. We begin with a wood panel, very often with braces to eliminate warping, and birch wood is very often used. The wood of the panel of the icon is the wood of the manger, and the wood of the cross. And so every stage of the production of the icon reminds us of our salvation history. The wood panel is prepared very, very carefully and then covered with some type of linen. And of course, the linen reminds us of the swaddling clothes in the manger and of the shroud. Uh, we use rabbit skin glue in pellets specially cooked with a recipe, and we glue the linen to the wood panel. Before putting the linen on, we make sure that the icon has a frame called a kovchech, or an arc, 
not unlike Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Covenant. And so here, this kovchech or this frame gives us the impression that we are looking into a different perspective outside of time and space. Icons are also windows into heaven. So once we have the linen on the panel, we then cover it, we cover the surface with something called gesso. Gesso is chalk dust or marble dust mixed in uh, with rabbit glue or with any kind of animal hide uh, glue. These natural elements work very well. We have icons from the 13th and 14th centuries that are in perfect condition using these same elements. Uh, we cover the linen with gesso, uh, and it's not unlike a canvas for painting, for oil painting or for acrylic painting. Canvases are cloth covered with gesso. The gesso is very rough at first, and there's a whole process of sanding, finely sanding, and making it as smooth and soft as possible to create a good surface for painting. So if you ever have asked someone to paint an icon or write an icon for you and it's taking them forever, you'll understand why. It takes a long time. Once we have covered the panel with gesso, uh, we transfer our drawing by tracing it onto the surface. The next step is to create the surfaces that are going to be covered with gold or gilded. Gilding is the process of covering a surface with gold. What we do is we usually use something called a clay bowl. Clay bowl is basically a clay. I've used uh, clay from PEI, beautiful red PEI clay dirt and rabbit skin glue and of course uh, a recipe that you can even find online for cooking uh, the clay bowl. In liquid form, it is then brushed onto the area. For example, here the halo is going to be gilded and brushed on. So once the clay bowl is brushed onto the background, softened, smoothed, it's ready to be gilded. And here we have the symbolism of of people being made from the clay of the earth and invigorated with divine breath. And that's exactly what we do to adhere the gold to the clay bowl. We breathe on it. And once we have an area that glistens and is moist, we then lay the gold. I'm not going to gild here online, but you will see that once we have areas that are well, well moistened, that they will stick to the clay bowl. And so here we have humanity in the clay and divinity in the gold. We use different textures and different qualities of gold. When we have gold leaf, we buy them usually in packets. They're very, very, very soft, very flimsy and hard to work with. As you can see how light that is. And once we lay the gold, uh, we then make sure that it's uh, nicely smoothed, adhered, and then we brush away the parts that we don't need. And I've got lots of chippings and lots of gold shavings to show. So once we have gilded the icon, we're ready to begin the painting. There are many different techniques for painting, and one is that we take a pigment uh, of each color, we mix it together, and we cover the whole icon in what is called chaos. Another is that we just work clean. The chaos idea was that out of chaos, God created order. And so the process of the icon always reminds us of our life, of the progression of our lives, and of our striving toward union with God and toward order out of the chaos. So once before we begin, we have to take our dry pigments and 
create paint out of them. And the way we do that is with this process of egg tempera. It's a painting technique that is ancient uh, in the second and third centuries after the use of encaustic. We find that uh, the use of egg yolk mixed with vinegar or with some other acidic uh, property created a wonderful, wonderful uh, emulsion or liquid to mix with pigment. In order to do this, uh, we begin again with the process of creating the egg emulsion. And as we do with every step of the icon, we ask for God's providence and help. So we break the egg and we separate the yolk from the egg white. This may look a little bit like a cooking class at this point, and it could well be because we don't use the egg white for anything except really good pinke and other meringues that Ukrainians are famous for making. But we do use the egg yolk uh, for the icon process. There is a longer process with this. Usually we rinse the yolk, we roll it in our hands, we make sure that it's very clean, but then we separate the inside of the yolk from the skin that covers it. And when we puncture the skin, we remember Christ's side being punctured on the cross. And we remember that the yolk is very nutritious. It's the lifeblood of the egg, and it also will form the lifeblood of our painting. So here we had a yolk that filled this part of the eggshell. And I will take that amount and I will pour vinegar. I can also use vinegar. I can also use white wine or some other acidic property to mix in. And when I shake this, this emulsion, the vinegar cuts through the fat of the egg yolk and creates a beautiful, beautiful emulsion, just as watercolor uses water and pigment, oil color, oil paint uses oil and pigment, and so egg tempera uses egg emulsion and pigment. It's been used for centuries. It doesn't smell, and it's very, very hardy and sturdy. We then take a little bit of emulsion, and you'll see that this is a very, very economic type of art form. We use only a few droplets. Put a few drops of egg emulsion into my container. I then take, I'll take a nice green color, and I take a very little bit of pigment, not very much at all. and mix. And I have a beautiful color to work with. So you will find, uh, if you enter a Ukrainian home, very often there is something called an icon corner, uh, where icons are venerated, meaning they're shown great respect. We don't worship wood and, uh, and gold and paint at all, but we show great respect the way we would for the photograph of a loved one. And here we have Christ, the mother of God. These two icons we received at our wedding, my husband and I uh, at our wedding, and that's usually a tradition. 
The icons are usually covered with a rushnik, and I'm sure you can watch the video on the Rushniki at the Capital Ukrainian Festival. And here we have family members, beloved people in, in our lives who have passed away. And we uh, begin our day by coming to our icon corner and devoting our day uh, to good work uh, inspired by God. So hopefully today you have learned a bit about the process of how an icon is made, going from the panel to the gold, to the pigments, first in dark layers, and then enlivened with detail and with lighter layers of pigment. And we experience this spiritual journey as we create the icon. It's highly recommended as a beautiful meditative, reflective practice uh, and a spiritual practice. And hopefully, if you are interested in icons, please comment on this video and uh, we'll try to point you in the direction of learning how to enter into this whole world of iconography as is seen in Byzantine icons and as we see the icons in Ukraine, uh, which has a rich legacy of, uh, of Eastern Christianity. Slava Isusu Christu, glory to Jesus Christ.